Hello, beautiful people, and welcome back to the Wee Ball Podcast. It has been a long time, but I am Luke Crummich. Joining me, as always, is Tyler DeSena. And it is that time of year, folks. Everything but the championship is wrapped up. It's senior bowl time. It's scouting time. It's draft time. Tyler DeSena, how are you? Doing good. Like you said, we took a long break. Life things, school I things. I had pneumonia. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on in both of our lives. But with this episode, we are hoping to bring you a lot of consistent content. And as things are ramping up, like Luke said, there's a lot of cool stuff coming up for us. We both will be at the Senior Bowl for the second consecutive year. We're both really excited, and this really marks the start of our Senior Bowl coverage. We're looking at the quarterbacks who have already been or who have already accepted their invites today, and it's safe to say it's a pretty fun list of guys that has a lot of potential talent and a lot of potential hype to gain from that week in Mobile. Yeah, um, listen, we love we love a man named Tyson Bajan, but last year's Senior Bowl quarterback class felt like it was lacking a little bit um this year that is not the case we have guys who are on the heisman podium former five stars we got some guys and i think we should start with that guy who i have been very critical of in the past i think we all know that i think it is time to talk about bohemian nicks bo nicks I think I'm going to change my view on him a little bit. So I'm going to let you go first before I ramble. I, Bo Nix is a guy that I think I'm being like almost forced to have an opinion on because that sounds weird, but I think that this is a quarterback that normally coming out of a draft class, I wouldn't have an opinion on. I'd kind of be like, okay, you know, like some positives, some negatives, but like, you know, a fun like little prospect that I think a team could pick on like day two, maybe day three and have like a lot of fun with, but Bo Nix has been relevant his entire college career. And this is kind of the the thing that reigns true about a majority of the quarterbacks in this class is that they've all been extremely relevant their entire college career besides Drake may, which we'll get to in another episode. But I think that Bo Nix, like I said, is an exciting player, but at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like, how high is the ceiling? He's going to be 24 years old on draft night, which, I mean, there's another quarterback on this list who's already 24 years old. There's another quarterback who, you know, like there's a lot of quarterbacks in this class that by the time they take their first NFL snap will be 23, 24 years old. And I don't know how great you feel about having a quarterback that going into their potential, you know, like fifth year option or whatever would be turning 29 or 30 years old already. And Bo Nix is one of those guys. I'm just not, I'm not high enough on him, but a lot of people, you know, I think we're at that early stage of the draft process where a lot of people don't really know where the range is for these guys. So you're hearing certain people talk about, hey, Bo Nix, day three guy. And then other people are like, hey, Bo Nix, first round talent. And it's like, he very likely is somewhere in the middle, but we don't really know that yet. And it's scary like we don't have that true barometer. I'm not the highest guy on Bo Nix, but I don't think he's ne- he's not like some bad prospect. Like I said, I think he's a fun prospect that you can take somewhere in that like late day two kind of range and be ha- really happy with him. But I'm not like I I honestly think I just said a whole lot of nothing, and that's how I feel about Bo Nix right now. I'm gonna say something. It is going to sound good because I said nothing. It is going to sound insane, but I need y'all to hang with me. I think Bo Nix was gifted with NFL franchise quarterback in aura. Not in football. I think everything we've heard about him, he's a great leader. He... Whenever wherever he goes, the fan base absolutely loves the guy. He's, you know, very marketable for some reason. I don't really understand it, but the guy's super marketable. He kind of just seems like like he seems like a nice guy, you know? Like we don't know him. We're gonna meet him. We don't know him. He seems like a good dude, relatively. 
But I, I think this year he was a better football player. I don't think he's like a crazy NFL quarterback, but if he's a 49er, he could win a Super Bowl and be their guy until he's 30, and then they don't have to pay him for these five years. Like, they're not going to pay him big money if he's, you know, day two guy. Four years, he's 29, and his like his prime is, like, starting to shrink for that style of quarterback. And you move on to the next one. You've won two Super Bowls. Like, there is a world where Bo Nix wins you two Super Bowls. There is a world where he plays three games. Yeah, Bo Nix, I think, is in a weird way a product of the wrong era of quarterback play. In that, yes. like, solely based on, like, aura and, like, his demeanor alone, he reminds me, and not, like, they're not the same guy, and they're obviously not the same football player, he reminds me so much of what people looked at Derek Carr as when he came out of college and like how owners kind of fell in love with him and he ended up going the top of day two and people were like, could he sneak into day one? Could he like, you know, is he going to fall even farther? And then he ends up being like a top of day two guy and then ends up being a starter for like, you know, a decade plus that that's like the weird. But the thing is, I don't know in this era of quarterback play and how many teams take guys at in the first round. I don't know if Bo Nix is talented and has the ceiling high enough to go in the first round. And I don't think that if he goes in the second round, I've had the whole thing about second round quarterbacks don't exist. I don't think if he goes in the second round, he gets that like Derek Carr treatment where it's like, Hey, you're a franchise quarterback that we took in the second round. I think he might fall into a weird middle ground that we've seen a lot of different times with plenty of different quarterbacks. And that's why you just don't see quarterbacks getting picked at the top of day two, unless they're Will Levis, I guess, as of recently. So, but that's like the only example in the last like five or so years. Yeah. And I think you could put him like, he doesn't have the upside of Will Levis and he doesn't have the upside of Drew Locke. It's a whole other thing that I'm not getting into right now because that's not what this podcast is about. But, like, he fits kind of that mold where fans love him of the teams that he's been a part of. Like, the the world was encapsulated by Missouri, Drew Locke. People oh, yeah. love to talk about Will Levis all of the last two seasons. I mean, Drew Locke just had a game where he had, he had a pretty good game where he threw that game winner against the Eagles, like, less than, like, a month ago now. I don't know, like, like what, a few weeks ago? And yeah. that lit up the internet still because Drew Locke is just that kind of, like, personality. And That's what we're talking about, I think, with yeah. Bo Nix. Because there's, like, the bodacious thing and, like, he just seems like a guy who you want to play with on the football field. Like, I would want to play with Bo Nix if I was – on the offensive side of the ball because I think he puts his body on the line even though you don't expect him to be that guy. And I do feel comfortable with him leading us down the field. I yeah. don't feel comfortable with him being a full-time NFL starting quarterback who wins you 12 games a year. But that's a whole nother story. And I think we've talked enough about Bo Nix. Last, we last thing, I think his mo- – if I have to go with like well, – I think – as we're talking about them as senior bowl guys, I think he's just, I think he will be somewhat fun to watch. And I think this could be one of the guys that definitely rises because of maybe not necessarily just what you see on the field, but you might start hearing the, like the snippets about how he's interviewed with teams, how he's, then I think that's where you could start seeing owner X is in love with Bo Nix. And I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of what he falls in line with as far as his senior bowl stock. I think he's a guy with a ton of room to grow in the eyes of draft people, but he might end up right about where or even below where fans think he is. And that's kind of what this class is, what makes this quarterback class super interesting is the fan perspective for a lot of these guys is, I think, way higher than when, where a lot of them are going to actually go. And then with other guys, it might be way lower than where they're actually going to go just because they weren't the big name their entire college football career. Speaking of a guy who was a big name his entire college football career, but kind of went under the radar this year with how good quarterback play was across the nation, former five-star, TV superstar, Spencer Rattler. 
everyone knows that I think Spencer Rattler at his best is a very, very good quarterback. I also think at his worst, he is still playing on Friday nights. There is a very big range of what Spencer Rattler is on a football field. He's made some of the most impressive throws I've seen from anyone in this class. But he's also thrown some of the worst balls in this class. It's very weird. We were saying something prior to this episode. And Tyler, I'm going to let you have this one. Go ahead and uh, put our little snippet out there. Yeah. So Spencer Rattler, (laughs) let me clear my throat real quick. Spencer Rattler is at his best a Sunday player and at his worst, like you said, a Friday player. But here's the thing. Most of the time, he ends up in this weird Saturday plus kind of mold where we don't know if he's an NFL guy or a college guy. And me and you were both joking that he's essentially just the human equivalent of Pac-12 after dark because his his uh, his games might end or start on a Saturday, end on a Sunday, or vice versa. And I think that's just like the weird range that he falls under when it comes to the way that he plays quarterback. So... Yeah, he's another guy with, I think, a ton to gain. But I think a lot of it is going to come out of his physical performance, like how live the arm looks and how good the throws themselves actually look and how consistent he is within the operation. Because I think that's where a lot of people's questions with Rattler are, are his operation, his pre-snap stuff. How is he going to like, how's his, I think his personality was another thing that people are still it's somewhat questioned about. It's weird. Yeah. Because the thing is at Oklahoma, that's all anyone talked about, that he's abrasive and like, you know, a diva. And like, you saw that on the QB one show that he's like yelling at teammates and all this stuff at South Carolina, the reports have been, Hey, Rattler is a great guy. And I wouldn't want to play for anyone else. And like players are leaving South Carolina now because he's gone going to college. Like there's wide receivers leaving that are like, well, I came here to play with Spencer. He's not here no more. I'm booking it out. And I think interviews will be big, but I think this is going to sound nuts. I think his media perception will be huge for Spencer Rattler. Because if he is well liked by the media, it will get ran over and over and over again. Spencer Rattler's growth personality wise is so big from QB1 to now, my story from the senior bowl. All of this stuff will get pushed and pushed and pushed. And then we'll go to the combine and teams will love interviewing with him there if he does have this personality shift. And it'll come out again and again and again. And he'll end up going in the end of the third high fourth round just from that because we know he has the arm we don't know that he has a consistency and you don't want this diva personality at quarterback but if he can prove to everyone that that's not who he is anymore it will be like a wow spencer's a changed man and everybody loves a story like that and let's be honest owners are just football fans owners don't know anything Owners are just football fans. And if they see a story like that, they see marketability and a franchise quarterback personality and a guy with a live arm. And they're like, I want him. Yeah, they see a guy who's exciting and has grown as a person over the last four years plus. They are going to want that in their locker room, even if he's not playing. And then as if you're a team with a middle of the road quarterback, they will the owner will be breathing down your neck to play a guy like Spencer Rattler. So there's a lot of teams that I think could be looking at him and maybe their GMs aren't looking super super hard yet, but their owners are and they will be come February. Here's the thing on Rattler. I think where he would fall perfectly for me is the kind of quarterback that like a genuine day 3 project guy. Like, there aren't many true day three project guys we've had in the NFL in quite a while. Like, I feel like that's another spot in the draft because a lot of guys either just go day one and then there's a couple that go in the back end of the sixth and end up getting cut and signed to the practice squad because they just wanted a chance to get them. And then there's not much else in between. He strikes me as like an early day three, like, 
you know, true development guy. But the only, again, with him is I know that we're talking about senior bowl guys. So it's something that you expect is that they're going to be older players. He will be 24 come week three of next year. Like I said, Rattler is going to be 24 by about week three of next year, which is his number one flaw. And it's like, if this is a guy that you're drafting and you are looking at as like maybe a day two player, which I know that I don't really think he falls in there. And this is one of the reasons why, and there's any expectation that he's going to play. He might be 25 by the time he touches the field for the first time. And th- this is the thing is it feels like it feels like every or not every, but a lot of the quarterback prospects in this year's draft have the exact same flaws that we were looking at a guy like Hendon Hooker last year. And we're like, that's there's 12 Hendon Hookers this year, and I don't know what to do. I'm mad. And yeah, continue. Yeah. And the thing is, is you look at you've been we've been seeing a guy like Spencer Rattler since he was a high schooler. And we're like, like yeah, I remember when he was one of the most hyped prospects in the country, Oklahoma. He's going to light it up of all time. And now we're at the point where he's almost in his, he's going to be in his mid twenties by the time he touches the field. And it's like, I just don't understand where the time went. And with this, like with the extra COVID years and all this stuff, we're in a weird position where a lot of these guys that we looked at as younger talents are just not as young as we once thought they were. So how many guys in this draft class are we really going to look at and be like, yeah, you can develop that guy right now. My thing is, we live in a much different world if Caleb Williams does not commit to Oklahoma because Spencer Rattler, there is no generational backup, and he's in the NFL already for two years with Sam Howell. Oh, yeah, for sure. That, I think if- it's the biggest – and then they all – everyone left Oklahoma. And now there's Dylan Gabriel, who's now at Oregon because Bo Nix left Oregon. This is, this is the worst. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And it's crazy that this is the draft class that kind of has all of the players of that ripple effect. Yes. We've got Bo Nix, we've got Caleb Williams, we've got Spencer Rattler. Like there, there is every single player. We have that Penix who transferred. Penix also. There are so many players who are tied into this like large domino effect, and they're all in this draft class, which is super exciting. But the thing is, the Jane problem Daniels. is, the problem is we so many of them we just like straight up don't know what they are because they just kept either moving around or didn't get the opportunity with the talent we wanted to see them with or when we thought they were going to have that talent it fell apart or they fell apart or there was injuries and there's so many different things which is what makes this class so exciting but I think that's it on Rattler who do we want to go next to I think we have to go to Pratty because I'm a big Michael Pratt guy but he was not great this year and in a class like this, I'm very worried for Michael Pratt. He needs to show up, needs to show up at the Senior Bowl because he can get jumped by some of the guys behind him that we're going to talk about. He can get pushed down even further by Rattler. There's already so many top-end quarterbacks. We have the big three. We have Penix. We have Bo Nix. We have all of these guys who are kind of like, either first round or somewhere in day two. And then there, there is a, a car crash of or like late day two, early day three guys where you could go anywhere from round three to undrafted. And you do not know. And for that reason, Michael Pratt has to make an impression with his brain, with his personality and with his arms I don't think there's any question about his athleticism. I think he's a decent enough athlete. Like he's an NFL level athlete. Make the throws consistently. Be accurate. Make the throws consistently at every level. He struggles at being consistently accurate at all three levels. It is a problem of his. There was rumors he was going to transfer, take his next year and go D like go be a, Blue Bloods quarterback for a team like Florida State who's losing Jordan Travis. I don't know that this was the best year for Michael Pratt to come out. He was injured. His team still performed when he was injured and almost beat Old Miss, who's a top 10 team in the nation. Like, this was a bad year to be Michael Pratt. 
and I'm hoping for the best for him because I really like him and I do believe in him, but there are, there's a lot that has to go right in Mobile for Michael Pratt. Yeah, Michael Pratt is in a really weird situation where you're already saying that it's probably not the right year for him to come out, although there probably weren't too many options for him to go and really succeed next year in college. I mean, even if you brought up a team like Florida State, they just lost a whole bunch of talent and had guys decommit. They just Florida State is in, as in Florida State <laughs> University students, an awful place right now as far as their football team. Um like they were trending so far upwards towards the end of like towards the like middle to end of December, they were trending so far up to the point where you're like, are they going to become like a powerhouse over these next few years, even without Travis, you know, moving in the right direction, they get dropped from the playoff. They, you know, a bunch Explode. of decommits, they get just absolutely blown out by Georgia. Like that nothing, it could not have gone worse for Florida state over the last month. However, we're not talking about Florida state although I could for a long time. We're talking about Michael Pratt, and he's in a weird position where it kind of is. It's He reminds me, not as a player necessarily, of the position that Bajent was kind of in last year, where he's the guy going into the Senior Bowl that nobody know, like nobody really expects to be the guy. Like, Bajent kind of took advantage of Bajan took advantage of what was honestly a weaker quarterback room and was able to be the best quarterback on his team for at least two of the three days and just looked better than the other guys. Pratt's in a different situation where he's going in as this lesser known player of the, he is definitely the least known of the five quarterbacks who have committed by far. He's the only one who has not been a big name at some point in their college football career. He's the only one that wasn't insanely highly touted, but He's going to have to outperform guys that are better than what we saw last year in Mobile, like by a lot. And that's where it gets interesting for Pratt is like, is he just going to kind of, I think, I don't know if it's going to come on the football field. He might be one of those guys that you just kind of look for a consistent three days. And then just yes. is, is it game manager? And then you see a couple nice plays and, and all of a sudden he kills interviews and kills the media, media availability. I think that's where Michael Pratt has the most to gain is just go out, be you for those three days, soak up as much information as you can, be an NFL quarterback for those three days, and then just kill it in interviews, kill it with the media. And then I think he's going to be a guy that teams are higher on than we see like social media, at least the mainstream. I, I think Michael Pratt, your best course of action if you're listening be a bookworm be the yes. guy who knows every single little thing about the playbook that they give you because this year it is one continuous staff from one team i believe uh instead of last year where it was the mix and match and now the mix and match is gonna be at shrine which we will talk about a little bit we're not going to be there but there are some names that we have to talk about this year uh unlike last year listen be the bookworm Impress every single position coach. Impress the guy who's going to be the head coach. Impress the offensive coordinator, the quarterback coach, the guy giving you water on the sidelines. Impress everyone on that football field. Have players talking about how great of a guy you are to work with, how you help them with the playbook. You just got to be a team player for a team that you're only ever going to be on for five days. Like that yeah. is the thing. Be I the mean, biggest team player for five days. One of the biggest things for, I mean, I'm going to keep bringing him up is the one of the biggest things that we literally saw from Tyson Bajan over that week in Mobile was not just the throws he was making and the fact that he looked like the best quarterback on his team for two or like possibly all three of those days. It was the fact that he was constantly in between his reps. The other quarterbacks are walking back and going to line up. He was in the ears of every single possible coach. And apparently Getsy. in the ear, in the ear of Luke Getzey enough to the point where he earned a spot on, like earned an undrafted free agent spot and then later earned a roster spot with the bears and then just QB2. by pretty much. And then starting games for that team as an undrafted rookie by just being there, being a sponge and soaking up everything he possibly could. And I think that that's the Pratt route, even though Pratt obviously not a D2 quarterback who's naturally coming from a worse position, but he's in a position where every quarterback above you 
has a name for themselves. You're crack. You're not a, you're not a household name compared to these guys. You're, you're not going to be talked about a whole lot and you're not even going to be talked about as much as Tyson Bajan because Tyson Bajan's dad was a all time great arm wrestler Electric. and fought and Electric. cut a promo with Tom Pelissero on live TV and arm wrestled them. Like Pratt just need, he need, it's not going to be, the media rise that a guy like a Bajan even had, it's going to be, can he go just kill it in interviews? And does he have that mind that football GMs coaches are seeing on the field and off of it? Yes. Let's move on to another guy who's kind of like, what are we doing here? Are we talking CDL? Are we talking UDFA? Are we talking contract? Are we talking draft pick? And that is Joe Millen. Joe Milton can throw a football a country mile. Joe Milton has experience at Michigan and has experience at Tennessee. Those are two pretty good programs, if you ask me. I don't know about you, Tyler. I think Michigan and Tennessee are pretty good. What's the problem? Oh, Joe Milton has been benched at Tennessee and at Michigan. He has lost his job everywhere, literally everywhere he's been. He's lost his his job. Like, there are obvious problems with Joe Milton. However, he can throw the football very far. Is this going to be a thing where he is going to impress some owners with just, hey, I can throw a football 90 yards? Or is Joe Milton going to be able to put together four days of very good practices and not just impress owners, but impress coaches and GMs? Yeah, I I think we're in a really weird place. First off, here's my bold prediction of the senior bowl. There will be at least one media, like, sectioned off event where Joe Milton is the only person on the football field and he just chucks it because that will break social media. Jim Nagy, you know this, and I would be willing to bet that he ends up, um, that he ends up throwing at least just one Hail Mary from one end of the field to most likely the other end of the field. And I think that he, or they might even have him throw it out of the stadium. I'm not sure. He's going to do something with his arm because he just has that kind of arm talent. And I just know that they want to put that on display. But as the quarterback, Joe Milton, a, another guy with a ton to gain, another guy who will be 24 come draft time. And like you said, his experience is, oh, who's this quarterback on the bench? He can throw the ball farther than anyone we've ever seen it. And then he plays and then he – connects on a couple of those deep balls and you're like, he's the guy. And then he gets benched not that far after because it kind of just falls apart. And I think Joe Milton is in a weird position where again, a huge name for a player that does not have the accolades to match that name. And I wonder if that's a guy we're looking at and we're like, how did he like, some people are like, how did he not get drafted super hot, like this high or whatever. And then he ends up sneaking, you know, back end of the seventh UDFA type guy. Like, I don't know what the range is for him. But Joe Millen is either going to be a great backup who doesn't play, but everyone's like, if he does, or he's going to be the XFL MVP for 15 years. He, there, there's more X factor in Joe Milton than we've had in one of these developmental type guys in the draft in a long time. He has yes. the, him and Rattler, have and Rattler is a higher draft pick in my opinion and most likely on draft day by a lot but if both of them were in a similar range those two have the most x factor of these kind of day three project guys we're at a weird point with Joe Milton and especially Rattler as well that we haven't seen in the NFL in quite some time that they both have that amount of X factor, but where does a guy like that get drafted in today's NFL? Cause we're seeing that teams would rather take, you know, guys with elite special teams ability or, or kickers or long snappers or fullbacks or just guys that have like one special trait and can contribute right away rather than taking a developmental quarterback prospect. And I just don't know where a guy like that ends up. I feel like it's a, it's more likely to see it on the back end of his, you know, like more so his floor of getting drafted than his ceiling solely because of the way the modern NFL is drafting guys at the quarterback position. That's not a slight to Joe Milton at all. I'm really, really excited to watch him, but 
It's just what does I, – I, I'm not sure where he fits. As for where he can make his mark, I think on the field itself is going to be a huge part of that because you just need to see consistent quarterback play from him, and he's going to have two or three throws, including ones just in like one-on-ones when they throw their fades to the back pylon where it's like – yeah, there's no, there was no other quarterback on this field that's hitting that. And that's where he can start vaulting guys because it's like Bo Nix isn't hitting that. Spencer Rattler's not hitting that. And you're talking about guys who are all of a sudden like, you know, day two, day three guys, and they're not hitting those throws. And Joe Milton is, that's the kind of guy where it's like, you know, my, my coach, my, my GM, my owner, they're going to be calling up. Like, did you see that? Did you see what he was doing? He can throw that thing. And that's where I think he could be really exciting. I agree, and we have one last guy. A man who hasn't played in a real offense his entire college football career, but he is always a talking point. One, Sam Hartman. I feel like at the beginning of every year, Sam Hartman gets round one hype, and I'm always like, hey, guys, serious question, why? And no one ever gives me a straight answer. And then by the end of the year, everyone's like, oh, yeah, Sam Hartman. Wasn't he getting first round hype? I don't think he's a bad quarterback. I think at Notre Dame this year, he had an aura. He had a very, like, you could be a guy. And then he doesn't play like one. And he just kind of plays quarterback. He isn't, like, a quarterback. Does that make any sense? He's what the media perception of Brock Purdy is. Yes. Yes. Um, like Brock Purdy, I think does way more in the, in the 49ers offense than uh than Sam Hartman has done his entire college career thus far. But he is what the media thinks Brock Purdy is. Like I hand the ball off to Christian McCaffrey and he goes 45 yards. Except it was Audric Estime and throwing the ball to AT Perry when he was at um Wake Forest. Wake Forest. Yeah, Wake Forest, right? I was making sure I got both of those right because for some odd reason I can't remember anything today. However, <laughs> I think like we're in an interesting spot with Hartman where it's just like, I think people just Hartman's the kind of guy where I feel like you're going to have certain scouts in your department who just like him, love him, like really love him. And this is where you confirm priors because you see him take a couple throws and make a couple throws and do offense stuff that he just hasn't done his entire career. And they're like, he can do it. Like he really can do it. It's kind of like Justin Herbert, but to a way lesser extent, because Justin Herbert way was lesser. a sixth pick, was a sixth overall pick. But it's like a way lesser version of that, where it's like, I just want to see the operation. Like, I just want to see what it looks like when it isn't the same thing every time. And he's not holding the mesh point for the longest in college football and or the longest like in football at all. And he's Ever. not operating this like weird offense. I want to see like, oh, here's a drop back. Here's like a normal play action pass. Like I, I think once if he just hits a couple of those throws and the operation looks nice, there's going to be a bunch of scouts there who are pointing at their GMs and are like him. I want him. And I, I just um, think that's kind of where he fits. I think the thing with him is going to be consistency. I think if he makes a couple of those throws, yeah, but he looks bad the rest of the time, that coaches won't want him. But if he is consistently decent the entire week and then it's a couple of those throws, it's like we've never seen him operate in an in an actual offense. Do we give him a year and check back in? Do we give him seventh-round pick, give him a year, see where he is? Do we draft him just to cut him and put him on the practice squad? Like – I think it's going to be that type of thing. I don't think he has a lot of room to vault up, but I think he can solidify himself getting drafted. Like this isn't a guy who's going to jump a bunch of dudes. This is a guy who it's like, are you getting drafted or are you not? That's it. That's the question right here, right now. Answer it. That is going to be all. That's where we're ending it because we are broke. Help us. Zoom premium. We need you. But Content is back, folks. I am so happy to be back with my boy. We apologize for the long hiatus, but it is time for us to cook. Thank you, and we ball.